very much for having invited me here to this festival. Nicola, Ivo, Stefan, and all of you. I am a third generation Chestertonian. At home I have books of Chestertons which belonged to my grandfather and to my father. And so I am the third generation. But I am convinced that one can only fully appreciate Chesterton if one comes to Croatia. <laughs> Why do I say this? Well, Lucy and I, having spent some lovely days in Dubrovnik and in Split, we arrived at Zagreb Airport and there was Ivo to meet us and he took us outside. And he said, wait here while I find my car, because I don't remember where I left it. And so, at that moment, I really understood the telegram which Gilbert once sent to Francis, saying, I am in Market Harbour, where should I be? And then, yesterday, or the day before yesterday, Stefan took us on a wonderful tour of Zagreb. And he told us that Zagreb was originally two separate cities, Kapdol and Gradic. And they used to be fighting between these two. And I thought, that is where Chesterton got the inspiration from the Napoleon of Notting Hill. These battling boroughs of London, they are just like the Croatian boroughs. And finally, I was reminded of the chapter in The Man Who Was Thursday called The Two Poets of Saffron Park. When Chesterton wrote about two poets, really he was thinking of the 200 poets who read us their poems last night. That were the real poets of Saffron Park to be found here in Zagreb. So thank you all very much. Now, my title is Gilbert Chesterton, A Man Alive. I take this title, of course, from his novel, Man Alive. You will remember that chapter one, how the great wind came to Beacon House, begins, a wind sprang high in the west, like a wave of unreasonable happiness and tore eastward across England, trailing with it the frosty scent of forests and the cold intoxication of the sea. In a million holes and corners, it refreshed a man like a flagon and astonished him like a blow. He goes on to expand on the effect of this alarming but beneficent wind, particularly on the group of friends gathered at Beacon House on the slopes of North London near Swiss Cottage. The wind blows a Panama hat into the garden, followed by an umbrella, a Gladstone bag, and finally over the wall comes Innocent Smith the man alive. This frontispiece from my 1912 first edition depicts Smith rather resembling the young G.K. Chesterton. More significantly, as the novel proceeds, the philosophy that Smith expounds is the philosophy of Chesterton the essence of a man fully alive. 
The great theme of all Chesterton's writings is the necessity of wonder. One must never take God's gifts for granted. One must never stop being surprised. As the novel unfolds, a number of grave accusations are made against Innocent Smith, and an impromptu court is set up at Beacon House to try them. He is accused of the attempted murder of the warden of a Cambridge college. The evidence presented reveals that the warden was expressing to Smith his pessimistic philosophy. All thinkers, said the warden, are pessimist thinkers. By producing a gun and threatening to shoot him, Smith induces the warden to make an ungainly leap onto the roof and to make certain affirmations showing that he had regained the will to live. The next chapter, The Two Curates, deals with the charge of burglary. One curate is induced by another curate who bears great resemblance to the socialist Anglo-Catholic priest Conrad Noel, as described in G.K.'s autobiography. He's induced to meet a third person for a nighttime walk that ends with the burgling of a house. A convoluted and comical explanation reveals that Smith is the third person, and he has, with accomplices, burgled his own house to obtain a proper appreciation of his home and belongings. The next chapter produces evidence that Smith abandoned his wife and set off to walk around the world, having amusing encounters with the philosophies of other countries. I have become a pilgrim to cure myself of being an exile, he says. His pilgrimage ends with him returning home and saying to his wife, oh, what a lovely place you have here, just as if he'd never seen it before. The final charge is of bigamy, that Smith has been observed proposing marriage to a number of ladies. Of course, all these ladies are his wife. They are in the habit of staging occasions when they can meet and fall in love once again, as if for the first time. I can quote you any number of lines from Chesterton's other works that express this philosophy of wonder. You will also find it in other poets, such as T.S. Eliot in Little Gidding, written in 1942. Eliot writes, we shall not cease from exploration. And the end of all our exploring will be to arrive where we started and know the place for the first time. Or we might look beyond poets and be reminded of this philosophy when we read the church father, Saint Irenaeus of Lyon. The glory of God is a man alive. You all know that Gilbert Keith Chesterton was born on the 29th of May, 1874, at 32 Sheffield Terrace on Campton Hill in Kensington, where you may see a plaque. His family had a Unitarian tradition and were rather vague believers. 
but he was baptized. On the 1st of July, in the nearby Anglican Church of St. George. If you ask the vicar nicely, he may give you a photocopy from the register. There is Gilbert's name, the third, the fourth one down. And he was schooled at St. Paul's School, where the library is named after. He always had a great love for London, shown especially in his novel, The Napoleon of Notting Hill. He dedicated this to his great friend, Hilaire Belloc, and he contrasted the moon seen by Belloc in the Sussex countryside with the moon that he saw, the largest lamp on Campton Hill. His philosophy of wonder compels him to value the characteristic features of a city. I am reminded of Psalm 121 in a modern translation, Jerusalem is built as a city strongly compact. The psalmist is not moping around with nostalgia for the rural life, he appreciates the urban life for what it is. Gilbert went to the Slade School of Art to train as an illustrator, and he was to produce delectable art all his life. But while there, influenced by the fin de siècle, weariness and decadence of the 1890s and dabbling in the occult, he entered a period of crisis. He describes it in his autobiography, in the chapter called How to Be a Lunatic, and there are references to it also in his play Magic. He emerged from this crisis by what he called one thin thread of thanks. A belief in God was needed in order to thank somebody for the gift of existence in this universe. He went on to develop a faith that was truly Christian and expressed it in his book Orthodoxy in 1908. There was a person who was sent to help him in this journey. In 1896, a friend took Gilbert to the house of a family named Blog in the artistic and very progressive suburb of Bedford Park in Chiswick. One daughter of this family was Frances, who worked for the Parents' National Educational Union a homeschooling organization. As Gilbert wrote in his autobiography, in that fashionable, advanced society, any number of people proclaimed religions, chiefly oriental religions, analyzed or argued about them. Francis practiced gardening, and on the same perverse principle, she actually practiced a religion. The religion she practiced was that of the Church of England. Gilbert and Francis were married at Kensington Parish Church in June 1901. They set up home in Kensington, then in a flat in Overstrand Mansions, Battersea, and in 1909 moved to Beaconsfield in Buckinghamshire. One reason may have been that Francis thought he would be better at some distance from the pubs of Fleet Street. But Gilbert gives a much more romantic explanation in his autobiography involving a bus, a lunatic asylum, and a train. Ten years ago, sorry, ten years later, 
in the dedication to his great poem, The Ballad of the White Horse, he acknowledged Francis's role in making him a Christian. Therefore, I bring these lines to you who brought the cross to me. In 1904, Gilbert went to give a lecture in Yorkshire and met the local Catholic priest, Father, later Monsignor, John O'Connor. Walking together on the moors, in answer to some questions raised by Chesterton, in connection with some rather sordid social questions of vice and crime, Father O'Connor went on to astound him with the depth of his acquaintance with vice and crime, acquired in the course of his calling as a Catholic priest. The seed was sown for the first of the Father Brown stories, The Blue Cross, published in 1911. The international criminal flambeau, disguised as a priest, accompanies the shabby, clumsy, turnip-faced Father Brown to Hampstead Heath, and there demands with menaces the priceless jeweled cross that Father Brown is carrying. Refusing to hand it over, Father Brown mentions various highly unpleasant criminal practices with which he is familiar. How in Tartarus, cried Flambeau, did you ever hear of the spiked bracelet? Oh, one's little flock, you know, said Father Brown. The series of Father Brown stories currently on television in England does the shabbiness and clumsiness rather well. The confrontations with penitent criminals are perhaps not quite so well done. Father John O'Connor, immortalized by Gilbert in the character of Father Brown, became a dear friend to Gilbert and Francis, and he played a great part in Gilbert's reception into the Catholic Church. Between November 1914 and March 1915, Gilbert suffered a major illness, lying at home in Beaconsfield in a coma, which in fact <coughs> was largely induced by his doctors in accordance with the methods of the day. Father O'Connor did come down from Yorkshire but Francis, in deference to the doctor's instructions, refused him access to the sick room. With Gilbert's recovery came a resumption of his desire to be a Catholic, held back principally because Francis was not yet ready to join him. By 1922, he was ready. And Francis was relieved that he'd made up his mind. Father O'Connor came down to Beaconsfield and received him into the church. Teresa's, the beautiful Catholic church of Beaconsfield, had not yet been built. And the congregation used a kind of shed with corrugated iron roof and wooden walls. It was part of the railway hotel, the local pub. Francis was to write to Father O'Connor that she was ready in 1926. 1926 was also the year that Dorothy Collins came into their lives. She was Gilbert's secretary and became like an adopted daughter to them. After the deaths, of Gilbert and then Francis, they had wanted her to live on in the cottage in the grounds of their house in Beaconsfield. 
She amassed a great collection of books and papers there until her death, when the Catholic charity to whom the main house, Top Meadow, had been given, sold it, and it is now a private house. Half of Dorothy's collection was bought by the British Library, and the catalogue of their holdings is available on their website. The other half was preserved by the great Chesterton scholar Aidan Mackey, first in Bedford, then in Oxford, where its current home is at the Oratory Church of St. Aloysius. The trustees have recently decided to hand the Chesterton Library over to the London campus of Notre Dame University the American University, where Gilbert received an honorary doctorate. Gilbert Chesterton <coughs> was, no, he is a man alive. I know, and many people know, that Gilbert Chesterton was sent to me to work for my salvation. In reading him, I know how far I am still from that salvation. I know, reading his hymn for the church militant, that, yea, we are very sick and sad who bring good news to all mankind. Why do I call Gilbert hearty? A dictionary definition of hearty might include the words cordial, good-natured, kindly, healthy, of keen appetite, full, abundant, boisterous, cheerful. But I am referring to a witticism by the critic Philip Guedella. Discussing the poetry of his time, he wrote, Mr. Chesterton seems to be suffering from a hearty degeneration of the fat. Delightful image. The medical term with which Guedala is playing, fatty degeneration of the heart, is rather obsolete now. A popular medical encyclopedia of the period describes it as a condition due to an excessive deposition of fat in the heart of people who eat and drink too much and do not take enough exercise. The typical patient would be unable to tolerate exercise, swollen with accumulated fluids and short of breath. Philip Guedala's bon mot set me thinking, what do we know of Chesterton's medical history? How did any illnesses of body and mind affect his literary output? In brief, was Gilbert Chesterton healthy or degenerate? Or can the two be combined? I went to view his death certificate at the General Registry Office, which is now part of the National Archives in London. The death of Gilbert Keith Chesterton, male, 62 years, occupation author, took place on the 14th of June, 1936, at Top Meadow, Beaconsfield. The cause of death was certified by Dr. George Bakewell, one of his two doctors, who are named and quoted in Maisie Ward's life. The immediate causes of death are listed in order, followed by other illnesses contributing to the death but not part of the sequence of events leading to it. The certified causes, this is one, two, three, four, five,
I have the sixth column from the left. 1A is anasarka, a rather old-fashioned term for generalized edema or dropsy. It, 1B is fatty degeneration myocardial. The myocardium is the muscular wall of the heart. So Philip Guedella's witty transposition turns out to have a basis in fact. A doctor today would probably rephrase causes 1A and 1B in the clinical description congestive cardiac failure due to ischemic heart disease. Cause 2 contributing but not related appears as cirrhosis of liver. The obvious cause of this is Chesterton's heroic intake of most forms of alcohol. But cirrhosis can be the end result of other conditions of the liver, including, conceivably, the result of heart failure. I happened to mention this certificate to my friend Christopher Howes, the journalist, and he brought it into his review of what was then the latest biography of Gilbert, the one by Joseph Pierce, called Wisdom and Innocence. In effect, he upbraided Joseph for leaving out this important evidence. Was Chesterton a saint? Didn't he drink too much, for example? There is certainly evidence not presented by Mr. Pierce that cirrhosis contributed to his death. Let us look again at Gilbert's major illness of 1914 to 1915. On 25th November 1914, Gilbert was speaking at the Oxford Union when he was overcome by a fit of dizziness and had to leave the platform. When he eventually reached home, he collapsed so heavily onto his bed that it broke. His weight, says his sister-in-law, Ada, was then 20 stone. When, in 1918, he was given a certificate of unfitness for military service, the height and weight were left discreetly blank. He sank into a coma. The archive at the British Library contains letters sent by Frances to her friend Josephine Ward, the mother of Maisie. Maisie Ward's biography quotes some of these letters, and Father O'Connor's book, Father Brown on Chesterton, quotes letters that he received. The exact diagnosis remains unclear, mostly heart failure, but there are complications, wrote Francis. Father O'Connor, in his book, reveals an important fact. He was 10 weeks unconscious and had to be kept so. Since the doctor said that a shock of recognition might destroy the brain, I can well believe O'Connor's important revelation, insufficiently stressed by most of those who quote him that this prolonged coma was largely iatrogenic, deliberately induced by sedatives. This method was a mainstay of treatment of cardiac problems for many years. The last cardiologist to practice prolonged narcosis retired from an eminent London hospital only a few years ago. 
This is the background to the agonized letters sent by Frances to her two Roman Catholic friends and to the incident in January 1915 when Josephine Ward decided to end Francis's indecision as to Gilbert's receiving the last rites from Father O'Connor, having made known to Francis his still hesitant inclination towards the Roman Church. Josephine sent for Father O'Connor herself, only for him to be turned away by Francis. She explained to me that part of the treatment, wrote the priest, which was so strict that she alone could enter the sick room. Does this episode cause the same bells to ring in your minds that do in mine? A sick room scene, with a Catholic priest forbidden on doctor's orders to anoint the dying man, lest the shock should tip him over the edge. Do you, like me, conclude that Evelyn War had this incident in mind when he described the deathbed of Lord Marchmain in Brideshead Revisited. For Chesterton, of course, it was not a deathbed. Francis's letters tell of his slow recovery. My favorite is the undated one to Josephine Ward, probably of 18th January. He asked for me today, which is a great advance, and he hugged me. I felt like Elijah, wasn't it? And shall go in the strength of that hug for 40 days. But again comes the sedation. The recovery will be very slow, the doctors tell me. And we have to prevent his using his brain at all. By Easter Eve, she was writing to both Josephine and Father O'Connor that she felt the enormous significance of the resurrection of the body. One person who wrote about Gilbert's health was his sister-in-law, Ada. Mrs. Cecil Chesterton. Her book, The Chestertons, has been much criticized for its inaccuracies and its apparent motivation by dislike of Francis. For Ada, the great watershed in Gilbert's life was the move to Beaconsfield. He had hardly endured a day's illness up to his collapse at Beaconsfield in 1914, when largely separated from men's society, the wine he took began to impair his bodily condition in the residential suburb of his later home. What he drank was not consumed by a divine fire, it went to his weakest organ, his liver. And it was his liver, poisoned, resentful, and inert, that killed him. Maisie Ward devotes an appendix of her book to refuting various unpleasant inaccuracies in Mrs. Cecil's work. And concerning these medical allegations, she had Dorothy Collins interview doctors Pocock and Bakewell. He says, wrote Dorothy, that the idea that G.K. was better when drinking in Fleet Street 
because the stimulus of conversation would eat up the effects of the alcohol is absolute nonsense. It would have just as bad an effect under any conditions. Dr. Bakewell said that GK was his patient for nearly 20 years, and during that time he never treated him for alcoholism or saw any trace of it, though in an absent-minded way he was always liable to drink too much of anything if it were before him, even water. The doctor says that Gilbert died of a failing heart owing to fatty degeneration leading to dropsy. The doctor said that he put him on the water wagon. This is a phrase meaning to be told by a doctor to drink no alcohol. He put him on the water wagon several times, and when this was done, Gilbert observed the rules very meticulously. Dr. Bakewell said that he did not do it very often because he did not think that drink was in any way affecting Gilbert's health during the greater part of the time he knew him. When he did forbid alcohol at certain periods, it was simply to make liquids less attractive, as too much of even water was bad for Gilbert. If Dr. Bakewell is quoted accurately, what are we to make then of cause two in his death certificate, which Dr. Bakewell signed five years previously? The contributory but unrelated cause of death, cirrhosis of liver. Cirrhosis can be the end result of various liver diseases besides that due to alcohol. It could be due to viral hepatitis, to the effects of back pressure on the liver in heart failure, and sometimes it is classed as cryptogenic, meaning of unknown cause. We know that in 1934, Gilbert suffered from jaundice. Was this a viral hepatitis that could lead to cirrhosis? Or was the jaundice indeed the result of alcohol? And was Dr. Bakewell just being tactful? Your guess is as good as mine. The final illness was short, and Francis succeeded in keeping it from the press, so the news burst suddenly on the world. In May 1936, he was being driven by Dorothy Collins to Lisieux and Lourdes. His heart failure became severe the following month in June. Two nurses and a specialist were called into him, and his parish priest, and Father Vincent McNabb, the eminent Dominican. On June the 14th, 1936, the Sunday within the octave of Corpus Christi, he died. Michael Coren's biography reproduces the memorial card, which quotes the introit for that Sunday, Factus Est with its delightfully apt reference to Gilbert's bulk. The Lord became my protector, and he brought me forth into a large place. So, what are we to make of the disagreement between Mrs. Cecil Chesterton and Dr. Bakewell as to whether alcohol damaged Gilbert's health? The chapter in Heretics called Omar and the Sacred Vine attacks the view that wine or such stuff 
should only be drunk as a medicine. If a man drinks wine in order to obtain pleasure, he is trying to obtain something exceptional, something he does not expect every hour of the day. But if a man drinks wine in order to obtain health, he is trying to get something natural, something that is that he ought not to be without. The sound rule in the matter would appear to be, like other sound rules, a paradox. Drink because you are happy, but never because you are miserable. Never drink because you need it, for this is rational drinking and the way to death and hell. But drink because you do not need it, for this is irrational drinking and the ancient health of the world. The essay, Wine When It Is Red, makes the same point. The safest way to drink is to drink carelessly. That is, without caring much for anything, and especially not caring for the drink. You recall Dr. Bakewell's testimony that Gilbert tended to drink anything absent-mindedly if it were there, even water. This healthy carelessness strikes a chord in the Christian reader. This attitude is relevant to more than just drink. Remember Chesterton's brilliant exegesis of he that will lose his life, the same shall save it in orthodoxy and also in <coughs> the ball and the cross. This is not a piece of mysticism for saints and heroes. It might be printed in an alpine guide or a drill book. A soldier surrounded by enemies, if he is to cut his way out, needs to combine a strong desire for living with a strange carelessness about dying. He must seek his life in a spirit of furious indifference to it. Indifference is the key. A better word than carelessness. Indifference is the Christian virtue which we find in St. Paul, who said in Philippians chapter 4 that he was ready for anything, full stomach, or empty stomach. And it is fully developed in the writing of St. Ignatius of Loyola. Indifference is closely allied to wonder, that central theme of Chesterton's philosophy. Where is wonder better expressed than where Chesterton uses the imagery of human anatomy in his poem the sword of surprise. Sunder me from my bones, O sword of God, till they stand stark and strange as do the trees, that I whose heart goes up with the soaring woods may marvel as much at these. Sunder me from my blood, that in the dark I hear that red ancestral river run, like branching buried floods that find the sea, but never see the sun. Give me miraculous eyes to see my eyes, those rolling mirrors made alive in me, terrible crystal more incredible than all the things they see. Sunder me from my soul, that I may see the sins like streaming wounds, the life's brave beat, till I shall save myself as I would save a stranger in the street. 
Wonder is closely allied to humility, for which he prays in a hymn for the church militant. <clears throat> Great God that bowest sky and star, bow down our towering thoughts to thee, and grant us in a faltering war the firm feet of humility. Lord, we that match the swords of flame, Lord, we that cry about thy car, we too are weak with pride and shame, we too are as our foemen are. Yea, we are mad as they are mad. Yea, we are blind as they are blind. Yea, we are very sick and sad who bring good news to all mankind. In conclusion, I would like to address the question, was Gilbert Chesterton healthy or degenerate? There is a story told about C.S. Lewis, that great intellectual follower of GKC. An American preacher came to see him and left saying in some bewilderment, that man smokes tobacco, that man drinks alcohol, that man even sometimes uses strong language, but I do believe he is a Christian. I say this of Gilbert Chesterton, that man suffered illnesses that may, in part, have been self-induced. That man weighed too much, maybe drank too much, and underwent degeneration of the body. But that man had a spirit of indifference, of wonder, and of humility. And that man is healthy. Smoking, uh, for, uh, I like to smoke uh, from time, time to time a uh, pipe. And uh, I was uh, wondering what uh, Chester uh, thinks about tobacco and smoking for I, we often heard that today, here today, that smoking is very bad, it's like a mortal sin, but uh, I don't think so, so can you comment on that too? Thank you. I defer to the opinion of the eminent theologians and holy priests who are with us today, um, but um, as far as I know, smoking is not listed among the sins. It is a duty of the Christian life to preserve one's health as much as possible, as much as is reasonable. Now, Zagreb is a beautiful city, and Lucy and I have been walking the streets of, these, of this beautiful city. And this is at great risk to our lives, because one of your trams could come and knock us down. Mm -hmm. Are we to stay always in a closed room in case a tram comes and knocks us down? No. We enjoy the uh, beauty of the city, because it, it, it exalts our life. It adds um, it adds to our appreciation of the good things that God has given us. But as far as possible, we should not, you know, jump straight in front of a tram. Um, likewise, I think, you know, tobacco, uh, I'm not a smoker myself, but, you know, from reading and talking to people uh, who have uh, smoked, um, I can understand that it greatly enhances life. You, um, you know, you feel more mellow, maybe, when you have smoked a pipe. Um, Sherlock Holmes 
that arrival to Father Brown, he used to talk about a three-pipe problem, a really difficult problem which he could only smoke, uh, which, sorry, which he could only solve when he had smoked three pipes. So I do not think that we are required as Christians to completely rule out everything in our lives which might impair our physical health. If it impairs our general appreciation of the good things of God, then carry on smoking. But I'm not speaking as a doctor. <laughs> I, I'm um, Ingrid Frankman. I'm the one whose uh, husband uh, re revived the Chesterton tradition in our neighbourhood here on the Turk. And I'm myself uh, an Oxford professor of international law, but I'm a great admirer of Chesterton. I very much appreciated your presentation. Uh, you used the word, though, uh, and this poor young man who is a victim of media that one shouldn't smoke. I'd like to remind you that free will is probably the best asset we have as Christians. And obviously it's a matter of quantity with everything. And uh, you used the word, you said, was he healthy or was he degenerate? Uh, sometimes that word has a very pejorative meaning in relation to morals rather. Uh. And uh, I just thought of mentioning that. Yes. And since I'm, as the guest of honor here, have been told not to speak, I will tell a joke, which I always find very refreshing in terms of how one should behave in life. And it's a journalist coming to a park to interview two very old men. And he asked the first one, how did you get so old? I said, well, I don't smoke, I don't drink, I sleep 12 hours a night, I don't go around with women, and I don't gamble. And how old are you? I'm 107. So he asked the second one, well, I, I quite frankly, I drink two bottles of whiskey a day and a bottle of wine. I drink 80, I smoke 80 cigarettes. I have been married six times, and I also have other lady friends on the side. And I sleep about four hours a night. And how old are you? I'm 32. <laughs> because it may show some of it is in the head and if we are good Christians I think that it is uh, our duty to stay away from the media indoctrination that we mustn't eat butter, we mustn't we must eat margarine when in fact without butter your eyes deteriorate and I think the body is quite a clever metabolism that knows instinctively if you need a little bit of salt or, or sugar. But uh, thank you again for your excellent talk. Thank you. I was using the word degeneration purely as a medical term. And uh, it was because I came across that joke of Philip Guedalas. Uh, Mr. Chesterton seems to be suffering from a hearty degeneration of the fat. Now, um, of course, when he wrote that, Guedella could not know that the doctors writing the death certificate would indeed say that he had fatty degeneration of the heart, the myocardium. Um, but, you know, so many medical conditions um, can be described as degeneration, and certainly you must not think that this is a moral condemnation. Um, for example, most people of my age, getting a little bit older, start to get a bit of pain in their hips, and they know that their hips are beginning to wear out. Um, well, the technical medical term for this is it's a degenerative disease. Um, so, by no means, by no means equate the degenerations of the body, which do occur in so many parts of the body, uh, by no means equate them with moral degeneration. Okay, thank you, William. Uh, another speaker? We have one more question. Uh, one question for you. Uh, you spoke to us a, a little bit about 
without uh, the necessity of wonder. Yes. In part, you uh, answered my question uh, that uh, the cure for uh, more wondering is humility. Uh, I was wondering what would you say and just as uh, thoughts for our uh, nowadays uh, times, what would be our greatest enemy uh, against wondering? as a tool very, very necessary for our sanctifying life. I think probably one could say that um, it's so easy to become bored. Like that warden of the Cambridge College who was, um, you know, who was um, um, attacked uh, in a a fake attack by Innocent Smith. He was saying, all thinkers are pessimist thinkers. Um, we, we find ourselves, you know, in our small ways, we find ourselves, you know, allowing ourselves to become bored and despondent and so on. Um, and in my own life, I have found Chesterton's writings a very good antidote to that kind of feeling. Um, it's not um, an, by any means you know, the only factor involved, um, but um, when I over the years have read Chesterton's works, that is what I have principally taken from them, the necessity of wonder. Yeah. Okay, uh, any more questions? No? No, okay, in that case... Question. I have a question. Oh. I have a question. Ah, you have a question. Uh, sir, uh, Dr. William, uh, what attracted you, you to Chesterton? It began so long ago. Um, I've said that I have some books which belong to my grandfather. Um, and so from an early age, um, I would have become acquainted with um, maybe some of his poems. Um, Certainly, when I was about 10 years old, I won a prize at school, and we could choose these prizes from uh, the books that were laid out on the table, and I chose the complete Father Brown stories. Mm -hmm. um, so I think, yes, uh, an early um, and, a, and very slight acquaintance with some of the poems. Um, and um, and Father Brown, and then everything else followed on from that. What is your favorite quote, the one on your card? Ah, well, I'm afraid I've left my card at home. Um, Lucy asked me yesterday, have you got your card? And I had to say, no, I'm afraid I've forgotten it. Um, it's in my study at home. Um, but let me think. Let me think. You, when Nicola um, enrolled me in the Chesterton Club, he gave me a membership card with a quote that he had chosen for me. Um, ah, yes, yes. Um, an inconvenience is a is an adventure considered wrongly, and an adventure is an inconvenience considered rightly. <laughs> That's from one of the essays. Okay, well, uh, there are no more questions. I would like to thank William once again. For his <laughs> to give you an applause.